From the great dams to the great mines, the Bucyrus Erie Company has been and remains a well-known and respected name in North America and throughout the world. Since its inception in 1880, this legendary institution has gained worldwide fame for its durable and well-designed machinery used by the construction and mining communities. Bucyrus Erie has built and developed some of the biggest earth-moving equipment this world has ever seen, as well as being pioneers in this field in all phases of earth-moving projects. One only has to ask and see these green, cream and maroon beauties still working after 30 or more years. Members of the International Union of Operating Engineers from all over North America are proud to have operated these highly dependable and versatile machines. B to the 38B to the 65D The classic and beautifully engineered 88B all are a treat to watch. Even today, historical institutions and museums are now recognizing the historic significance and importance this company has played in our nation. Since the building of the Panama Canal, the name Bucyrus Erie can be seen on some of the biggest earth-moving projects, providing the necessities for a strong and vital economy, the backbone of industrious and modern societies. Not only is this a great name, Bucyrus Erie, but a great legend as well. And this story is a tribute to those men and women of yesterday and today that made our world a better place to live.
shovel is more revered than the Bucyrus Erie 3850B. A full 35 minutes of this presentation is devoted to a visit to the king of shoveling. Historic shoveling, because after some 35 years, during which it single-handedly dug the equivalent of two Panama canals, the last of the super shovels was retired in the summer of 1992. Don't beat this machine, it's a king of all of them. King of the mines! King, king of all shovels. But our story begins much earlier. Since prehistory, man has come up with ingenious and better ways of moving the earth, thus escaping the laborious task of manual labor. Some of the early concepts developed by Leonardo da Vinci were inspiration for inventors to come. The principle of a spoon-type dredge conceived of in 1420 was combined with a steam engine providing an advanced form of mechanical dredging in 1796. But on land, apart from only limited assistance from the horse and scraper, the pick and shovel reigned supreme. Early attempts to adapt dredges for land use all foundered on the harsh terrain. It was 1835 before William Smith Otis, spurred on by the opportunities in developing the railroad, built the first dry land shovel, a step worthy of the giants, but also somewhat frustrating. Young Otis's untimely death, the family's desire to protect its patent, relatively cheap labor, and a question of reliability slowed its introduction and restricted the shovel's application to railway construction for almost 45 years. Finally, in 1862, a handful of companies, including one run by Oliver S. Chapman, were licensed to build improved Otis shovels, and the shovel was on the move again. In 1880, when Bucyrus entered the field, America was on the move as well. There were canals to be dug, new mines to be developed, and later, roads, power dams, and more. Cyrus's first shovel, the Thompson, was reliable and versatile. It doubled as a rail car derrick. Among the early improvements to the Otis shovel was the replacement of the mast by an A-frame and booms that rotated from the base, and the almost total use of iron and steel. But soon the power shovel, now fully revolving, was beginning to prove its worth in widespread mining operations. In 1905, Bucyrus shipped 18 shovels to the historic Rio Tinto copper mines in Spain. Others of increasing size followed. In 1910, the Vulcan Shovel Company joined the team. Bucyrus, already specializing in excavation equipment and recognized as a company open and able to take on the larger projects, was rewarded with the opportunity to supply sample machines to the Panama Canal Commission, a 75-ton and two 90-ton shovels. Eventually, some 77 of their shovels performed the lion's share of uniting the oceans. In 1912, a peak year, they removed 16 million tons of soil and rock. That's former President Teddy Roosevelt on a Bucyrus shovel. About this time, a prominent mining operation challenged the Marion Power Shovel Company, Bucyrus's major competitor, with the specifications for a true strip mining shovel. 
Less than a year later, in 1912, Bucyrus's answer to the Marion shovel was the 150B and the 175B steam shovels. The latter with a three and a half yard dipper and able to handle 40 feet of overburden. Later, these shovels were available with electric power. And it was the start of a healthy rivalry that powered shovel development. Full revolution and hydraulic leveling jacks became standard. Booms went to 90 feet, dippers to 6 yards. Electric motors, now with Ward Leonard controls, provided speed and power curves similar to steam. First the shovel was freed from its tracks, then the slow, large tractor wheel was swept away by the application of Bucyrus pioneered crawlers. In 1927, the Bucyrus name was joined by that of Erie. Almost as old a company as Bucyrus, and originally called the Ball Engine Company, the Erie Steam Shovel Company was the prime manufacturer of small shovels built Model T style with standardized parts. In 1928, Bucyrus Erie introduced the 750B with twin hoist ropes, eliminating cracked dipper handles and twisted booms. A timely move, because with the new alloys available, the early 30s saw a marked increase in dipper capacities. In the same period, BE grew as well, being joined by Ruston and Hornsby, a venerable British company whose first shovel had been the Navi, slang for a pick and shovel laborer. In 1935, Bucyrus introduces the 950B with features that would serve them well in future machines, such as independent propulsion, tubular dipper stick, two-piece welded boom, and a simple rope crowd that allowed the machinery to be located at the base, lightening the front end. Throughout the development of the shovel, there was a similar development of the drag lines that worked with them on many projects. In the 40s, these were joined by a wheeled excavator, with the wheel built by Bucyrus and the base by Marion. The concept was pioneered by Frank F. Colby. In action, it output a thousand feet per hour of the softer topsoils, about five times more than a drag line. Shovel development was further spurred by the development of rotary drills, which could provide better bank preparation and the era of the super shovel began. In 1956, near Cadiz, Ohio, Marion's mountaineer with a 60-yard bucket took the first bite. In 1957, Bucyrus Erie's 1650B River Queen with its 145-foot boom, 86-foot dipper handle, and a 55-yard dipper began stripping two seams at once for Peabody Coal in Kentucky the first of five of these giants to come. Then a truly gigantic step. In 1960, it was announced to the world that Bucyrus Erie would build a shovel of unbelievable proportions, ordered by Merle C. Kels, President Peabody Coal Company. A model 3850B with a whopping 115-yard dipper and a 210-foot boom. President Eisenhower was presented with a model of the 3850B. The first Lot 1 mechanical shovel went to work in 1962. The job of supervising the erection of Lot 1 went to BE employee J.E. Red Payne, along with his son Ronald, who helped put the electrical system in place for the monstrous shovel. In this picture, they are seen with Robert G. Allen on the right, then president of Bucyrus Erie. Peabody provided 38 of their own men to help in the erection of this machine. The shovel was nicknamed Big Hog and was put to work at Peabody's Sinclair Mine near the town of Paradise in western Kentucky. Later followed in 1964 by another 3850B, Lot 2 mechanical, with a 148-yard dipper. History was being made. The King. There were other models still being built. The single 1850B was setting new records in Kansas at the Pittsburgh and Midway Coal Company. In 1966, the Silver Spade, a 1950B, was moving 155 tons with each pass for Hanna Coal Company in Ohio. Later, in 67, another 1950B, the Gem of Egypt, the Spade's twin, went to work in the same mine. 
These two were the only Bucyrus Erie models that used knee action crowd. Knee action crowd was first used by the Marion Power Shovel Company. But the 3850Bs remained the kings. All of Bucyrus Erie's stripping shovels were built at this plant in South Milwaukee, Wisconsin. They were all created for the economical extraction of coal. And this was the team responsible for the engineering and design of the 3850Bs. George Y. Anderson, Vice President of Engineering. Luther Blanchett, Chief Engineer, Mining Machinery. Tom Learmont, Engineer in Charge of Quarry and Mining Machines. Don Barber, Product Engineer in Charge, Electrical Section, Large Excavator Division. M. W. Kreshnewski, Project Engineer, Large Excavators, and Robert Talley, Project Engineer, Large Excavators. This is the cylinder for one of the leveling jacks. Here are the crawlers shown being pre-assembled in the plant. One of the corner pieces for the lower works. The 148-yard bucket's lip alone weighs more than 20 tons and was the single biggest casting in Bucyrus Erie's history. This is part of the undercarriage for the massive shovel. This dipper handle is more than 130 feet long and 7 feet in diameter and is made from 3-inch thick nickel alloy steel. A man can and does walk inside the full length of the boom to inspect for cracks. Here is the turntable shown with two welders working on its assembly. This is one of four sets of crawlers shown during its erection on the job site. The Mammoth 3850B machine was shipped from BE South Milwaukee, Wisconsin plant in pre-assembled parts on 300 railroad flat cars, and it took 11 months to assemble it at the Peabody Coal Company's River King mine site near Freeburg, Illinois. It began operations in the fall of 1964. This is what it's all about. This is a lump of uh, coal from River King Pit 6 here. It is from the Heron number 16. The primary purpose of the coal is to burn, produce steam, and the electricity that you use in your house. A small amount of our coal is sold for industrial purposes, but by far most of the coal mined here is used to make electricity. To anyone who loves great machines, actions speak louder than words. So we will let much of the following video footage of the massive 3850B shovel speak for itself.
dipper capacity of 148 cubic yards, a total weight of almost 20 million pounds, exceeding that of a Navy cruiser, it's as wide as an eight-lane highway, 45 feet higher than Niagara Falls, and standing 90 feet taller than the Statue of Liberty. This is a monarch of all its surveys. Dipper down to depth of cut, driven in by the crowd, and up by the hoist, swung to, discharged. Dipper ready for the next cut. That's the cycle less than every 60 seconds. Around 175 tons in each scoop, 100,000 cubic yards per day, 44 million cubic yards per year. All the time uncovering 15,000 tons of coal daily. A single operator sits 60 feet above the pit floor in an air-conditioned cab using two hand levers and two foot pedals. The operator can accelerate a dipper load from zero to 25 miles per hour in eight seconds flat and stop it in less than four seconds. The machine works reliably in all conditions, 24 hours a day. The shovel sits on four hydraulic jacks, one for each set of dual crawlers, and has mercury leveling table operating valves which keep the machine level at all times when digging on uneven ground. Its hydraulic system contains 4,500 gallons of hydraulic fluid 
fed automatically to the cylinders and operates under 3,000 psi pressure. Each cylinder weighs 35 tons, each piston 30 tons. carries approximately 1,200 tons of steel ballast in the rear compartments of its revolving frame in order to affect the moment of tipping. The sheer enormity of the dipper's capacity is about the size of an average two-car garage. The renewable caps on each of the dipper's seven teeth weigh 500 pounds each. I'm Charlie Lehman, a welder at Pit 6. This is a Kohler for 3850 shovel. We've been welding on it, trying to get it back in repair because we got one on the machine that's bad and we need to exchange it.
shovel has a self-operating elevator with a 1,000 pound capacity, or three people, and travels from the second floor to the fifth floor main machinery deck. It has 52 electric motors, ranging from one quarter to 3,000 horsepower, total of 12,000 horsepower, including eight hoist motors from 625 to 1,250 horsepower, six swing motors from 500 to 1,000 horsepower, and two crowd motors from 100 to 500 horsepower. It has its own well-equipped machine shop, including a 30-ton traveling crane, and rivals many a factory. Yeah, I, uh, 
I've got that serial number on the off the 38. Do I have it mounted? Price possession, eh? <laughs> it's not for sale. And it ain't for sale, eh? It's not for sale.
shovel is powered through a 7,200 volt training cable and it uses as much electricity during a 24 hour period as a town of 15,000 people. sits on a 54-foot diameter roller circle with 80 21-inch diameter bearings, having an 18-inch diameter face. Well, Jim, I see you working them uh, levers like uh, you know what you're doing. Well, I hope so. <laughs> uh, I'll better. Yeah, yeah. Been a long time behind them. I wish I had another 46 years to go with them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you look like a real shovel man on top of that, a real bizarre Aziri man. And I'm sure that uh, the HCEA guys, once they see this tape, including Keith Haddock, they wish they were there. You're right. But uh, they, for now, they can eat their hearts out. You're right, bro. I tell you what, you don't beat this machine. It's a king of all of them. King of the mines. The king, king of all shovels. This right here, the big ball of shovels. It's been a great one. Yeah. And I tell you what, my good friend Crash Dusky was a designer of this machine for me. Crash Dusky of Bruce Area. Bruce Iris Area. Yeah. He's a good friend of mine. He designed this machine. And a tremendous machine. You can't be ashamed of designing this shovel. He made one of the best in the world when he designed this one. Yeah, well, I've always believed Bazaar Siri made the best machine for yeah, 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 the mining technology. I mean, when this, by the, far, by far. when this machine was built, they were so proud of it, you know, they were really proud of it. And I can understand why. Because it's a real gem. That's why right. it's called the king of the mines. That's right. It, it's a fine machine. You don't beat it. But it's a, like I said, it's a king of the mall. Yeah. There's none of them that have done what this is. Jim, you say that with a glint in your eyes and a big smile, eh? You know, I guess it's made a lot of money for you in the past, eh? Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 It's made a, a lot of money for a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, I expect it. The saddle block sits 15 stories above the ground. The shovel moves the dipper 420 feet, more than a city block, on a 200-foot boom.
3850B built by Basara Siri, obviously doing some uh, nighttime work, cleaning off that high wall. You can see by the massive machine how this thing is built, how it runs, how many seconds it takes to go from A to B on the circle. It's a well-built machine and a well-engineered machine. I'm sure that Peabody officials as well, Basara Siri, were very proud of the machine when it was built in 1960s. With new challenges and the development of other excavation equipment like BE's super drag lines, the era of the super shovel has come to an end. One of the super strippers, the model 1850B, is now preserved as a museum and is located in Hallowell, Kansas. It began operation in Freeburg, Illinois in 1964, and by the time it was retired near Sparta, Illinois in the summer of 1992, the machine had dug its way pit by pit a total distance of 20 miles between the two towns. The king may well be the last of them, but it's not the last of shoveling, nor the engineering skills and know-how of those who designed, built, and operated them. For all the shovel has ever claimed to do is scale up a skill that comes naturally to each generation. 
progress begins with excavation and we will always have the need to move the earth. is a tribute to the men at Bucyrus Erie who designed and built the machine. And it gives me a real sense of pride to be associated with such an organization. All of our company's workers can be justly proud of this accomplishment.